Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Today we are in the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. This gallery displays Mark Clark and Margaret Coe, Our Lives in, in Paint, a retrospective exhibit which celebrates the half-century relationship of Eugene painters Margaret Coe and Mark Clark, who passed away in January of 2016. With us today are artist Margaret Coe and Makash Associate Curator Danielle Knapp. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Danielle, first, let's start with you. Tell us how this exhibition came about. How did it develop? Well, um, we've been fortunate as a museum with our staff all to have really admired Mark and Peg's work, to have known them for years. Um, our director, Jill Hartz, and I, um, soon after I was hired, we just acquired a work by Peg for the collection. We already had some works by both artists in the collection. Um, but in the years that followed, especially 2013, 2014, people kept letting us know there was a high level of interest in seeing Mark and Peg's work in the museum. Um, and we started brainstorming, well, how can we make that happen in one of our gallery spaces to um, put a lot of work on view and do a really special exhibition. Um, so we approached them at that time with the idea and luckily they were excited about it. And so um, it's been years of anticipation um, putting this show together. Um, certainly we did not expect to lose Mark as, as part of that process during that time and um, having that opportunity to continue to work closely with Peg um, and to think about what we can represent about Mark's life and his work has been a very special honoring experience for us. So you're the Makash Associate Curator. Who was David Makash? Oh, David Makash. Um, he was a very important instructor in the art department here, um, was hired in 1934, initially came out from the Chicago area um, to teach lithography here. So he didn't even realize that, that Oregon would become the rest of his life's uh, you know, place for inspiration and for important teaching. Um, that lithography class and teaching painting um, just introduced students to a professor who had trained at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, you know, had that pedigree, but had this really interesting, unique way of interpreting the visual world. And certainly in talking with artists like Peg and others who studied with him at some point during the three and a half decades he taught here, you get a great sense of how important he was as a teacher and how he shaped future painters, um, not just to try to achieve what he was doing in painting, but to think about the visual world in a really exciting, highly personalized way. And we are fortunate at the museum to house um, his collection of artwork, his archive, a lot of materials that he and his late wife, um, Ann Kuka Makash, who was also a phenomenal painter, left to the university. So Peg, um, Danielle's just sort of introduce my next question. Tell us why David Makash was important in your life and in Mark's life. Oh my God, he was a real mentor for us. Uh, uh, first of all, he was, uh, he had very strict standards. <laughs> uh, you know, he was, he, you, you took a lot of drawing with him and you, you worked towards accuracy, a couple of things. You, uh, you did, you absolutely didn't do what so many people do in drawing, where they try to get an individual style going right away. It was very much about observation and kind of jotting down one connection between maybe a point and a point mm -hmm. at a time. And, uh, and then constantly, you know, you had a string, so you constantly were, were uh, checking and, and correcting yourself. So you were correcting yourself for accuracy all the uh, time. And his, Paint, the way he taught paintings, we both took watercolor and oil painting from him. He worked with patches of color, so there was kind of a correlation between the process of observation and uh, note taking, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in the way that he taught drawing, which was just a kind of a short line at a time, uh, and, uh, and just always kind of making a clear observation rather than doing anything that's just sort of like facile. And, uh, and the way he had you paint, which is kind of one patch of color at a time. So, so there was a process where the image evolved, but it was so deeply about observation. Hmm, hmm. So, so fascinating. So you and Mark shared this remarkable partnership in life and art. Um, now that you are where you are, when you look back, how do you think that partnership shaped your respective styles and uh, approaches as artists? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I would say that it's, and I've mentioned this in other situations, that Mark had already been in the military and come back, uh, you know, to do graduate work when I met him and I was still an undergraduate. So uh, he was really accomplished at that, at that point. And uh, so I admired that greatly. It was, a, 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 you know, one of the 
first things I noticed about him was he's a very good artist. And, and uh, so my feeling is that he just uh, evolved, you know, to, you know, over time. But I feel like I was a little bit doing catch up mm -hmm. because I was uh, painting and drawing, but I really was, you know, just still learning some things that he already, uh, uh, you know, mastered. So he, so I think in the very early years there was a, a mentor-like relationship, you know, uh, and th though it wasn't as it wasn't, uh, we didn't work in the same studio, which is mm -hmm. kind of more conversational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as we evolved over the years, is that it was a value to us both to be, to be very s separate in our painting. And, uh, and it was kind of, like, we really liked to get together for coffee or something like we, that. This was a big theme in our, our work. So it was kind of like you had, uh, this is our factory or our office or something, but people, each person's doing their own research or something. Right. And so you're not really consulting each other, often, most often not even showing each other the other work. I, I know I've met people who thought, surely you have these critiques mm -hmm. or something, which we absolutely did not. Because it was just like, we were just uh, pals, you know, we were doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we had a show, we, or you know, had the occasion to have work on the wall, we, uh, we talked about it, but it was, uh, but it was really quite separate. Though I think it's, uh, what we did always have, this, always stayed the same, was that we always liked the same artists, whether mm. they were newer artists or older artists. We liked what we considered very painterly <laughs> uh, artists, uh, more than we did someone with a great idea or something, nice. you know, that's, that was more yeah, conceptual yeah. or something. We, we weren't as thrilled with the work as we were something that came from this same sort of painterly background, this kind of strange place that, that we came <laughs> from and the people that we knew, you know, Nelson and Sangren and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all these people. It, there was sort of a little more mystery, the real painting is struggling with the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we just were, we were just connected to that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that didn't change. So we had the same tastes. Uh, yeah, interesting. So say a little bit about how you think about Mark's approach to painting. How would you characterize him as a painter? Well, uh, the well, first word that comes to mind is natural, mm -hmm. is that I think he was truly uh, a natural talent uh, that it showed up very early as an undergrad. He was taking, it happened that Oregon State had mm -hmm. some very hot young faculty, uh, thanks to Gordon Gilkey, <laughs> who was the head of the department. And, uh, so it was very thrilling. They were showing and things, and, and uh, Mark, uh, this is before I knew him, of course, mm -hmm. but he submitted a show to the Oregon Annual, which was, at that time, you submitted the real work. You know, that was the process. You just dropped it off, and, and he was, I don't know, well, you know, he had been less than 22, and it's gotten his, it got in the show, and, and I think it was Jameson's that didn't get in the show, and he was really <laughs> angry and said, claimed that a student should never be sending to a professional show. But that's how, he, that's, that was just that he had this uh, a kind of natural design talent, a really, uh, you know, he did beautiful little cartoons. He just, he just had some sort of natural skills mm -hmm. and he just had some inspirational instruction. And uh, so I think he just did a really kind of sensuous, lovely, uh, and solid work from the uh, beginning. Uh, over time, he developed more of a process, particularly when he uh, decided, when he cho chose to do just acrylic and, mm -hmm. and drop the oil painting. Then, then it, it, that acrylic, of course, is kind of a plastic medium. And so uh, it's a challenge to make it rich uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that oil painting. And it dries much more quickly, doesn't it? Yes, which he loved. You know, that was a big part of it. But uh, anyway, but it was also a good challenge for his technical skills mm -hmm. to, to have come up with approaches for using that, that allow, he felt he could do anything that could be done in oils mm. and, acry and acrylics. And so that, that was a big, I, I, had, I think that technical aspect uh, is a big part of his process that he was determined, because he never went back to oils. Mm -hmm. And this was mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, he just, he claimed that 
many of the great older painters, I can't remember who he cited particularly, but he said, but once in a while I'd say, if he knew about acrylic, he'd have been working with acrylic, <laughs> you know. And so he was just, uh, so uh, the fact that he was working with a medium and he was trying to do things with it that mm -hmm. it didn't naturally do was a big part of his process. Hmm, fascinating. And he, you know, he's known especially as a landscape painter and mm -hmm. in particular a painter of Oregon landscapes. Yes. So what was it about, why was landscape a, a, a genre that he was drawn to? Do you know what? I think that's really a, a great question. Oh, I, okay. I mean, really, and I say that because Mark's one of the few people I met who was a fifth generation uh -huh. Oregonian. Mm -hmm. And so that means that his great grandparents were pioneers and they, had, they were in uh, a part of Oregon that's uh, called uh, Clark's Four Corners, so his name. They had, a, they had kind of a general store mm -hmm. there and, of course, farmed. And so, uh, and most of the, and, the, and the personality of almost all of his relatives were just to, you know, st stay in Oregon. You know, they didn't venture out. Mark really didn't like to venture out very much. Mm -hmm. But he, and he grew up in Junction City and uh, he got a car when he was in high school and he would drive to Corvallis and different places. But anyway, he, was went, to, you know, he went to Oregon State and he would also like to go to McMinnville mm -hmm. and, uh, and visit his grandparents. There were just you know, places that he did, or all kind of on that 99 mm -hmm. highway. Well, so he drove uh, you know, 99 his whole life from the time he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And he really loved that landscape, the farmland and the rows of trees and these kind of, and he, he knew them so well that he would, uh, uh, he would just, you know, it's not like you're looking at a cathedral where you really have to draw it particularly. Yes, right. So, but he could, memor uh, often, he, uh, often he memorized, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, this particular group of trees on a mound, you know, one of them kind of scraggling to the right or something that he could memorize that and he used that as a reference. And he truly loved that, you know, that were reminding him of home, hearth, his, his, uh, both his grandparents were great people. We just loved them. And he, he just, it's just an, a true affinity for the, the exact lines and the coast too. But mm -hmm. that valley landscape, I think, is um, something that he did all his life mm -hmm. once he started painting. <laughs> Fascinating. So he's also a, a painter of portraits. We're sitting in front of one. Say, what's, uh, what's distinctive about Mark's approach to portrait painting? Well, uh, he, had, he would never allow you to say that he was a portrait painter. Okay. And this is, uh, which, uh, is, uh, this is the reason why he's actually had, uh, well, Roger Zadek, you might know Roger mm -hmm. Zadek. He wanted Mark to do a portrait of Elaine. <laughs> and, and they're great friends and everything, but Mark refused to do it because he hadn't been trained as a portrait painter. Uh -huh. he, was think, he, he thought of a portrait painter as someone who truly did the traditional, uh, I would say, um, classic mm -hmm. approach to, to doing uh, portraiture. And so he didn't feel like, he didn't want to be put in that uh, category. He did, he had a friend from New York named Leslie Barrett, who was an actor who, would visit and talked him into doing a portrait of him. And it was a very interesting portrait. And it looked like him, but it was, it was profile. And, and I thought he was, uh, you know, he clearly could have done portraits mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. he, you know, he really had the skills. But he didn't, I don't think he thought he had that finish of, of a truly sculpted mm -hmm. uh, face uh, that you connect with traditional portraits. So he wouldn't consider himself a portrait painter. But, to, to go on with the question about uh, his approach to it, there were a couple of things. One is that he, he liked having a sitter, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, he, and for that reason, he often went to Modkern's Art Center sessions and would start a painting there and uh, get quite a bit of information and maybe stylize it and work on it a little bit. And they have a distinct look, that mm -hmm. type of uh, portrait painting. But others, uh, his, he, he used the figure, I'll say figurative instead of uh, uh, sure. portrait at this point, but he, it was an outlet for his imagination. Is when he wanted to do something that was more expressionistic looking or, or uh, uh, rougher. I think he really, it was kind of like he, his 
his, this type of work bordered on masks. Mm -hmm. You know that, mm -hmm. that that it was just that that sort of work uh, was uh, he in that case he still used acrylic, but he used a lot of modeling paste mm -hmm. because in that case he wanted a rough uh, look. But those were uh, you know completely from his imagination, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. let them go in any direction with you know abstract them until he until something looked. You know, captivated him, and said, okay, I guess this can go. This can be framed. <laughs> so, Danielle, tell us a little bit about Mark's relationship to the museum. Tell us about his work at the museum. Oh the well, he was. Um, you know, this museum has a history; it's over 80 years old, and so um, it wasn't always as big or as large of a staff as it has now. Um, and when Mark was coming out of his graduate program, and he and Peg were first married, uh, I think it was David McCosh that got wind of there being a, a need to hire someone to help out with the museum and had recommended Mark to the museum director. Um, so he was hired on and stayed here in that first um, time period as an employee for what, 10 or 11 close years, to, working that, yeah. on exhibitions as a preparator, curating exhibitions, um, you know, making sure the museum runs, helping on the small staff. Um, and so he was creating his own work during that time. So he was balancing a day job with mm -hmm. being a working artist. Um, and at one point he was able to step away from that job, supporting himself on his artwork sales, um, which is great, being able to be in the studio full time is the dream. Um, and then was able to come back to the museum, I think when with the economy and things took a turn and was looking for work again, came back again to work. So I think a combined, what, over 20, we did the math over mm -hmm. 20 years yes. um, across three decades, three or four decades working in this museum. So. Um, to us, he, you know, that's like a member of the family. He has his history here, um, where we know there are works in the museum where he worked on their frames or these shows that he organized. And um, at that same time, you have an exhibition history that shows his work and Peg's work and um, their colleagues from that same period, post um, sort of the MFA era, um, being shown in the museum as well and, and since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating story. Now, Peg, you work in oils. Yes. Mm -hmm. So why why did you not go the acrylic route? What is it about oil paint that's important? Well, for you? Uh, I did. Uh, there was it was in the seventies that I did paint with acrylics mostly, uh, and that was that that sort of magical period of time when uh, we just sold everything we painted. It mm -hmm. was just there was just a period of time when there were not that many painters around. We were the youngest of the group of people that were being collected by banks and, mm -hmm. and things. And so, yes. uh, and I, I don't know, it just, and then plus I was working in a little studio, the children were small, so my studio was a room right off the kitchen, and, uh, and you, you really wouldn't have wanted oil paint, you know, for the mm -hmm. smell and everything there. And it was closed off, so that, but I needed to be able to, I, I painted during nap time, mm -hmm. so I'm probably one of the few people that had a formal nap time <laughs> for my kids, but that gave me two, sometimes three hours uh, to paint, and then they could stay up till 9.30 or something. I didn't care, but anyway, uh, but that uh, acrylic worked out real well for that, and about the time that I decided to go back and do my MFA, I started thinking about painting, actually even thinking about the paintings I would do right. as, as my application process. And I just got to thinking about how with, uh, with oil paint, you can really mix a value on that palette. And it's, it's that value, it's not as, it's, it's uh, more stable, it's more, it's, it's uh, harder to do that with acrylic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I was sort of, I was interested in that. And so I started doing uh, smaller paintings. It was kind of like I thought, I'm, this, is, this is serious. What do I really think about painting? And so I, I started, and then I just kept working with oils. I did, um, I did, I do now use acrylic mm -hmm. as underpaintings. Mm -hmm. And that's because over the period of the years that I've painted, uh, I've found that, uh, especially with larger paintings, almost, and I would have to say exclusively almost with larger paintings, is that to do an, a more or less monochromatic underpainting, but to work with uh, rollers, mm -hmm. you know, little paint rollers, which I was able to, when I was in France, able to buy some that were really a small, so very, you can manipulate them very easily. And you could just boldly get an, a composition uh, in a single, you know, maybe two hour or so setting. Mm -hmm. Uh, you could get 
a design, you know, with, with that. And I liked that a lot, but I like uh, for the most, and occasionally, I even, even recently, will like what's going on with acrylics. And, is, and uh, but I tend to, what I often like about it is that if I've started something with acrylic, I might like a little bit of that transparent quality because it is a water-based mm -hmm. medium. I might like a little bit of that. And I, uh, I don't have any interest in, I just had never had an interest in using it the way Mark did, which was a system of layers and layers and layers of glaze and scumbling. I just, that just didn't interest me. I, uh, and so I didn't try it, but I did like it and continue to like it as a, a way, like instead of gesso, just gessoing mm -hmm. your canvas, let's use black and white gesso and sometimes mix it up and then see if we can get a bit of an image uh, to work with as the underpainting. So that's how I use it. So it's so interesting that the two of you have very distinctive styles and approaches. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that Mark was really in, did, didn't like to travel, was really an Oregon painter, but you've, you've, you've I mean, there are paintings in the show that are uh, paintings that were inspired by specific locations in Europe. You just mentioned that you, you, you got these rollers in France. Why, is, why has that been an important part of, you, of your art making, to go to Europe or to go to other places? Why has that been important well, for I you? Think it, I think it's a combination of it. Just ha One thing is that I do believe that when you have a long-held desire mm -hmm. for something, that that tends to emerge into reality at some <laughs> point in your life. And of course, all the time that my kids were growing up, I was still, you know, I was just doing things from around here. Mm -hmm. and, and then when and Karen was working in Portland and I'd go and visit her and I did my city, would take photographs on the street, did my city street series that lasted about almost 10 years. But uh, there was, and so I hadn't traveled, I'd had two trips to Europe as a, when I was younger, you know, really younger. And uh, then, I just didn't, wasn't really thinking about it, but I did have, a, I remember from very young, being a very young woman, always thinking, well, I hope that I go to Europe, you know, seven times, <laughs> you know, and just, it was just kind of a fantasy. Well, anyway, I had a friend in 1999, by this time, of course, both my kids are out of the nest and mm -hmm. all this, and uh, my uh, friend Satoko, who teaches at LCC, was actually doing a sabbatical in, um, in uh, Tuscany, and uh, she had said prior to this, she said, "Oh, you should come and visit me." And I said, "Oh no, you've, you've been inviting people. You need time." But anyway, she decided she had this one week when she was going to do some traveling and go to Berlin, where I'd never been. So I decided to go and you know take a month and uh, spend the first week traveling with her, and then uh, and then I uh, had a rental rental car, and I didn't even know where I was going to go. And I ended up in, uh, uh, on the coastline of the uh, Cinque Terre. I was just kind of going towards France. And, and I just, I was trying, I had this book about monasteries and I couldn't, I, I couldn't find it or anything. So finally I just found, I saw a sign and it said Al Mare. And I thought, that's good, I'll go to the, to the water. And then I saw, uh, a place that uh, was a, a auto hotel, you know, hotel that had parking. I can't remember what they called it, but I thought this is where I'm staying because it was getting to be about, you know, close to dark. And I uh, knocked on the door, and uh, there was actually a young woman inside because the place was locked. And she came out, oh, we're closed for the season. This was in the, early November. And uh, I said, no, I need a place to stay, you know. And, and uh, so anyway, I said, okay, you could stay one night. Well, anyway, so I, uh, so I I'd stayed that night in, in this room and then got up in the morning and went out and did a painting and then came back. And her father knew English. She knew uh -huh. English, too. The mother didn't know English. But her father saw the painting, got all excited about it, and decided, that, I think they had one other person that was a full-time resident, and they decided, oh, you can stay, and when we're gonna be working on your rooms, we'll move you. So anyway, I ended up spending 15 days there, <laughs> and I handled it just like a painting trip to the coast. You know, I went out painting, every day, and I was, by that, I just thought, you know, I could do this. I can do oil paintings. Uh, you know, on a on a trip to Europe, just like a painting trip to the coast, and uh, and I just 
then I got an opportunity to do a residency in France right after that. And I just, I just thought, well, as long as I'm selling the uh, paintings to pay for the trip, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> So I did that, and I just became, and I just, I just loved being in those places, and I always stayed for um, I, those early, that was four week, one month when I stayed with Satoko, and after that I'd stay six to seven weeks. And uh, then I, late, the more recent trips, I have not stayed that long, but, uh, but I just, it's just this great pleasure that was, uh, somewhere in the back of my fantasy that I'd want to do and but didn't but I just sort of after that first trip with Satoko back I mm -hmm. just uh, it just became a reality. <laughs> Fascinating so we just have a couple of minutes left Danielle I'll give you one and maybe we'll have time for one more with Peg. Why are the paintings of Margaret Coe and Mark Clark important for the museum the JSMA the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art? There, you know, we're a museum with a strong focus in Pacific Northwest art. We want to show the best, most exciting painting, especially from Oregon, and um, especially to highlight artists who weren't just Oregon or Northwest artists, but artists painting here who made their lives here. Um, it's a really important history worth celebrating. And the paintings themselves, any one of these works, has so much to just get lost in as a viewer. You feel so much from the artist's experience. Um, especially when you know the background, their history, uh, that information about when or why or where they were traveling or painting or not traveling in Mark's <laughs> case. Um, and so we just really wanted to honor the fact that there are phenomenal artists who have been making their careers here, who have been um, looking out the windows that we all look out here in Eugene, looking at that same sky, that same landscape, um, the same people and mm -hmm. responding to that in their incredible artistic creative interpretations. And so, um, and it was a dream project. You know, we wanted to work with Mark and Peg. We wanted to, uh, we call this a retrospective because it is looking back and the earliest work in the show is from the late 50s. Um, but with how much work that they have created and with how large many of Peg's paintings are that we couldn't have, wouldn't have been able to borrow to fit <laughs> here. Some of her finest work that's publicly available to see in the Holt Center or elsewhere in Eugene. Um, you know, we just wanted to, it was, sort of selfish too, is that we wanted their work, we wanted to talk about them in our museum, we wanted to be the place for other people to come and be able to enjoy them and share their stories about what their work and their friendships have meant to people here. My last question, Peg, is for you. Um, who are some, tell me a couple of artists who have inspired you. Well, I think, you know, you were all, you mentioned earlier something about regional mm -hmm. art and and uh, I just think that we thought of ourselves as regional artists mm -hmm. from the beginning. Once we were actually uh, in collections, music, or I would say uh, bank collections that were collecting uh, a lot of important uh, older regional artists. But you know, people like Charles Haney and C.S. Price were, I, I, they were so much in, I think both of our minds, but definitely I thought about them in the early years. I, and of course there's, there's times, like with, when I do color things, that when I'm, Bonard was important. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of artists that have been important. But I do want to stress uh, the, uh, just the fecundity of the regional art scene and how much we admired the Northwest sensibility, how much we felt it. Uh, we used a lot of earth colors, if uh, you know, at that time, and uh, as did Charles Haney and C.S. Price, and and I think in a sense they were almost more important for the way our vision was going than say Makash, who was definitely our foundation. You know that we learned. In fact, you know, our very early. Uh, when we were first married, people thought our work looked quite a bit alike because we, were so, we, we had enough of the uh, Makash uh, influence. So he was certainly, you know, that's your teacher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I really, I still just think it's that, that the mid-century Oregon artists, uh, you know, had heart. Okay, well that's a wonderful place for us to end. I want to thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. I've been speaking with the artist Margaret Coe and Makash Associate Curator Danielle Knapp. Mark Clark and Margaret Coe, Our Lives in Paint is on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art through April 1st, 2018. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>